Chapter Three of the World That Couldn't Be by Clifford D. C. Mac. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three. Duncan did not see the arrow coming. He heard the swishing whistle and felt the wind of it on the right side of his throat, and then it thunked into a tree behind him. He leaped aside and dived for the cover of a tumbled mound of boulders, and almost instinctively his thumb pushed the fire control of the rifle up to automatic. He crouched behind the jumbled rocks and peered ahead. There was not a thing to see. The hula trees shimmered in the blaze of sun, and the thorn bush was gray and lifeless, and the only things astir were three stilt birds walking gravely a quarter of a mile away. Separ, he whispered. Here, Miss Thaw. Keep low, it's still out there. Whatever it might be, still out there and waiting for another shot. Duncan shivered remembering the feel of the arrow flying past his throat. A hell of a way for a man to die, out at the tail end of nowhere with an arrow in his throat, and a scared stiff native heading back for home as fast as it could go. He flicked the control on the rifle back to single fire, crawled around the rock pile and sprinted for a grove of trees that stood on higher ground. He reached them, and there he flanked the spot from which the arrow must have come. He unlimbered the binoculars and glassed the area. He still saw no sign. Whatever had taken the pot shot at them had made its getaway. He walked back to the tree where the arrow still stood out, its point driven deep into the bark. He grasped the shaft and wrenched the arrow free. You can come out now, he called to Sipar. There's no one around. The arrow was unbelievably crude. The unfeathered shaft looked as if it had been battered off to the proper length with a jagged stone. The arrowhead was unflaked flint picked up from some outcropping or dry creek bed, and it was awkwardly bound to the shaft with the tough but pliant inner bark of the hula tree. You recognize this? he asked Sipar. The native took the arrow and examined it. Not my tribe. Of course not your tribe. Yours wouldn't take a shot at us. Some other tribe, perhaps. Very poor arrow. I know that. But it could kill you just as dead as if it were a good one. Do you recognize it? No tribe made this arrow, Sipar declared. Child, maybe. What would child do way out here? That's what I thought, too, said Duncan. He took the arrow back, held it between his thumbs and forefingers, and twirled it slowly, with a terrifying thought nibbling at his brain. It couldn't be. It was too fantastic. He wondered if the sun was finally getting him that he had thought of it at all. He squatted down and dug at the ground with the makeshift arrow point, Sipar, what do you actually know about the Scyther? Nothing, mister. Scared of it is all. We are turning back. If there's something that you know, something that would help us. It was as close as he could come to begging aid. It was further than he had meant to go. He should not have asked at all, he thought angrily. I do not know, the native said. Duncan cast the arrow to one side and rose to his feet. He cradled the rifle in his arm. Let's go. He watched Sipar trot ahead. Crafty little stinker, he told himself. It knows more than it's telling. They toiled into the afternoon. It was, if possible, hotter and drier than the day before. There was a sense of tension in the air. No, that was rot, and even if there were, a man must act as if it were not there. If he let himself fall prey to every mood out in this empty land, he only had himself to blame for whatever happened to him. The tracking was harder now. The day before, the Scyther had only run away, straight line fleeing to keep ahead of them, 
to stay out of their reach. Now it was becoming tricky. It backtracked often in an attempt to throw them off. Twice in the afternoon the trail blanked out entirely, and it was only after long searching that Separ picked it up again. In one instance, a mile away from where it had vanished in thin air. That vanishing bothered Duncan more than he would admit. Trails do not disappear entirely. Not when the terrain remains the same. Not when the weather is unchanged. Something was going on. Something, perhaps, that Separ knew far more about than it was willing to divulge. He watched the native closely, and there seemed nothing suspicious. It continued at its work. It was, for all to see, the good and faithful hound. Late in the afternoon, the plane on which they had been traveling suddenly dropped away. They stood poised on the brink of a great escarpment, and looked far out to great tangled forests and a flowing river. It was like suddenly coming into another and beautiful room that one had not expected. This was new land, never seen before by any earthman, for no one had ever mentioned that somewhere to the west a forest lay beyond the bush. Men coming in from space had seen it, probably, but only as a different color marking on the planet. To them it made no difference. But to the men who lived on Lanyard, to the planter and the trader, the prospector and the hunter, it was important. And I, thought Duncan with a sense of triumph, am the man who found it. Mista! Now what? Out there, schoon! I don't. Out there, Mista, across the river. Duncan saw it then, a haze in the blueness of the rift, a puff of copper moving very fast. And as he watched, he heard the far-off keening of the storm, a shiver in the air rather than a sound. He watched in fascination as it moved along the river, and saw the boiling fury it made out of the forest. It struck and crossed the river, and the river for a moment seemed to stand on end, with a sheet of silvery water splashed toward the sky. Then it was gone as quickly as it had happened and there was a tumbled slash across the forest where the churning winds had traveled. Back at the farm, Zakara had warned him of the schoon. This was the season for them, it had said, and a man caught in one wouldn't have a chance. Duncan let his breath out slowly. Bad, said Sipar. Yes, very bad. He fast, no warning. "'What about the trail?' asked Duncan. "'Did the Scyther?' Separ nodded downward. "'Can we make it before nightfall?' "'I think so,' Separ answered. It was rougher than they had thought. Twice they went down blind trails that pinched off, with sheer rock faces opening out into drops of hundreds of feet, and were forced to climb again and find another way. They reached the bottom of the escarpment as the brief twilight closed in, and they hurried to gather firewood. There was no water, but a little was still left in their canteens, and they made do with that. After their scant meal of rockahominy, Separ rolled himself into a ball and went to sleep immediately. Duncan sat with his back against a boulder which one day long ago had fallen from the slope above them, but was now half buried in the soil that through the ages had kept sifting down. Two days gone, he told himself. Was there, after all, some truth in the whispered tales that made the rounds back at the settlements, that no one should waste his time in tracking down the Scytha, because a Scytha was unkillable? Nonsense, he told himself. And yet the hunt had toughened, the trail become more difficult, the Scytha a much more cunning and elusive quarry. Where it had run from them the day before, now it fought to shake them off. And if it did that the second day, why had it not tried to throw them off the first? And what about the third day, tomorrow? He shook his head. 
It seemed incredible that an animal would become more formidable as the hunt progressed. But that seemed to be exactly what was happening. More spooked, perhaps, more frightened. Only the Scytha did not act like a frightened beast. It was acting like an animal that was gaining savvy and determination, and that was somehow frightening. From far off to the west, toward the forest and the river, came the laughter and the howling of a pack of screamers. Duncan leaned his rifle against the boulder and got up to pile more wood on the fire. He stared out into the western darkness, listening to the racket. He made a wry face and pushed a hand absent-mindedly through his hair. He put out a silent hope that the screamers would decide to keep their distance. They were something a man could do without. Behind him a pebble came bumping down the slope. It thudded to a rest just short of the fire. Duncan spun around. Foolish thing to do, he thought, to camp so near the slope. If something big should start to move, they'd be out of luck. He stood and listened. The night was quiet. Even the screamers had shut up for the moment. Just one rolling rock, and he had his hackles up. He'd have to get himself in hand. He went back to the boulder, and as he stooped to pick up the rifle, he heard the faint beginning of a rumble. He straightened swiftly to face the scarp that blotted out the star-strewn sky, and the rumble grew. In one leap he was at Separ's side. He reached down and grasped the native by an arm, jerked it erect, held it on its feet. Separ's eyes snapped open, blinking in the firelight. The rumble had grown to a roar, and there were thumping noises as of heavy boulders bouncing, and beneath the roar the silky, ominous rustle of sliding soil and rock. Separ jerked its arm free of Duncan's grip and plunged into the darkness. Duncan whirled and followed. They ran, stumbling in the dark, and behind them the roar of the sliding, bouncing rock became a throaty roll of thunder that filled the night from brim to brim. As he ran, Duncan could feel, in dread anticipation, the gusty breath of hurtling debris blowing on his neck, the crushing impact of a boulder smashing into him, the engulfing flood of tumbling Tullus snatching at his legs. A puff of blowing dust came out and caught them, and they ran, choking as well as stumbling. Off to the left of them, a mighty chunk of rock chugged along the ground in jerky, almost reluctant fashion. Then the thunder stopped and all one could hear was the small slitherings of the lesser debris as it trickled down the slope. Duncan stopped running and slowly turned around. The campfire was gone, buried, no doubt, beneath tons of overlay, and the stars had paled because of the great cloud of dust which still billowed up into the sky. He heard Separ moving near him and reached out a hand, searching for the tracker, not knowing exactly where it was. He found the native, grasped it by the shoulder, and pulled it up beside him. Separ was shivering. "'It's all right,' said Duncan. And it was all right, he reassured himself. He still had the rifle. The extra drum of ammunition and the knife were on his belt, the bag of rockahominy in his pocket. The canteens were all they had lost, the canteens and the fire. "'We'll have to hold up somewhere for the night,' Duncan said. "'There are screamers on the loose.' He didn't like what he was thinking, nor the sharp edge of fear that was beginning to crowd in upon him. He tried to shrug it off, but it still stayed with him, just out of reach. Separ plucked at his elbow. "'Thorn ticket, mister, over there. We could crawl inside. We would be safe from screamers.' "'It was torture.' but they made it. "'Screamers and you are taboo,' said Duncan, suddenly remembering. "'How come you are afraid of them?' "'Afraid for you, mister, mostly. Afraid for myself just a little. The screamers could forget. They might not recognize me until too late. Safer here.' "'I agree with you,' said Duncan. The screamers came, 
and padded all about the thicket. The beasts sniffed and clawed at the thorns to reach them, but finally went away. When morning came, Duncan and Separ climbed the scarp, clambering over the boulders and the tons of soil and rock that covered their camping place. Following the gash cut by the slide, they clambered up the slope and finally reached the point of the slide's beginning. There they found the depression in which the poised slab of rock had rested, and where the supporting soil had been dug away so that it could be started with a push down the slope above the campfire. And all about were the deeply sunken pug marks of the Scytha. End of Chapter 3